and now here. Okay. So uh, is everybody on Jupyter Hub on day three geo mapping tutorial? I would like you to open the first notebook so you can follow along. Uh, hopefully, someone will learn something here, but I end up taking an approach of being very basic. Um, I know there are some map experts here who are probably going to be bored with this tutorial, but please, if you have any questions, just interrupt me anytime. Um, the first one is on base map and Cartopie. Who here used one of those before? Okay, cool. Uh, who here is still stuck with base map and haven't got to Cartopi yet? Yeah, so I have a slide for you. And now the right question. Who here doesn't like to raise their hands when asked? Yeah, it usually happens. So the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to open a data set that we're going to play with. Uh, it's the challenger path. It's a bunch of latitudes and longitudes that we have here on a pandas data frame. Uh, feel free to execute the cells anytime. You don't need to wait for me to execute. But on the exercise, even though you have the answer in there, just wait a little bit and try to do it by yourself. So it's just a bunch of latitudes and longitudes. And base map is kind of an old concept that Matplotlib abandoned. It lives on this NPL toolkit namespace. Sorry, can you speak louder? Did you execute the very first cell? On top? Huh. Is everybody having that problem? That's weird. Right. So you execute this one first. Oh, it's because you're on slide mode. Sorry. Go uh, out of the slide mode using Alt and R. And it's even better if you don't follow in slide mode. Slide mode is for me only, so I should not make that default. Uh, you can probably follow better if you're not on slide mode because you can see what we did past and what we're going to do next. Okay? So does everybody, everybody out of slide mode now? And by the way, that was a question, so you got a feature. Okay. So I'm back on slide mode, but please do not follow me on slide mode. So everybody got this point? You have the data set? Off, Alt, and R. Or you can do it with the mouse too. If you navigate to the top center, you're probably going to see an X button. And got it? Okay. Uh, use your stickers. We have some helpers here. Like Don is an expert, and he's around here somewhere. Oh, there he is. He's sitting over there, and that's the one Yeah, that's him. <laughs> So base map uh, used this old concept of living on this MPL toolkit uh, of Matplotlib. Uh, I think only one or two other packages ever did that, but this is an abandoned concept. So you need to import Matplotlib and base map. And the way I usually do it, I create functions for my maps. I don't do that scripting line by line because then I can reuse these functions. Uh, so in this case, I create a make base map function where I have this keyword arguments with some default options, figure size, projection, resolution. Uh, the figure size I pass to the matplotlib object, where I create the figure and the axis object. Those that are familiar with matplotlib know what I'm doing. Those who are not familiar, feel free to ask what I'm doing here. And then we actually get to the base map part, where we create this M object, or map object, using that projection, the resolution, in this case, a hard-coded a center longitude, that could be a keyword argument on that function as well, and I pass the figure axis. So base map has this awkward object, in my opinion, because then you need to access this map object to do everything, including projection. So in this case, I'm just drawing the coastlines and filling the continents. So I'm gonna execute this, and now I'm gonna call the function using only the default values, and I'm going to use my M object to draw parallels and regions. Then I'm also going to convert my latitude and longitudes to the figure projection using that same map object. And only then I can plot. But as you can see, I'm not plotting with matplotlib. I'm again plotting with that map object. This is why base map is a little bit awkward if you're coming from matplotlib. Sure. 
Sure. No problem. I'm just going to execute the cell, and I'm going to stop right here so you can see the figure. Uh, so we have a really nice figure using the Robin projection. Uh, we have some labels. The labels on base map, uh, we decide where to put them using the syntax of trues and falses. Uh, to be honest, I never remember which is which. Like in this case, I'm doing the left and the top. But for example, if I make this one true as well, I will get label, I hope, on the right. Yes, there they are. But these are hard to remember. This is one, another one of my pet peeves with base map. You do. To, to be honest, latest ma versions, they have, um, let me show you, they have an option to bypass that, but it's not default, and I don't really know okay. why they did that. Like, we can do this. If I let a long keyword set to true, it will do the conversion automatically for you. But for some reason, that was not default, and people don't use that. So let me just execute this again. Uh, you probably have the figure there. Any questions about base map? No? By the way, you got a sticker. So the only reason I had base map here was to show you this. Base map is at end of life. Base map is no longer supported. If you're using base map, you should start moving to Cartopy. Cartopy is where all the developers, the former developers of BaseMap and the developers of Cartopy are investing their time. And Cartopy integrates way better with Matplotlib, solving all those issues that I was talking about earlier and others as well. So let's do the same plotting with Cartopy. Uh, first, we need to import the Cartopy coordinate reference system. We import that as CCRS, it's just a convention, like we import NumPy as NP. And we are going to do, create our map. There are some very similar patterns that you can see here. I'm passing a projection and a figure size. In this case, the projection is not a string, like in base map. The projection actually is actually an object. In, when you pass that object to Matplotlib directly, like in this case, I'm just giving that projection to the Matplotlib figure, now Matplotlib knows about the projection. So we are going to use all Matplotlib methods to plot. And Matplotlib will do the magic behind the, the curtain for us of converting and, and doing all the projections. So let's execute this one. And now we're going to do the same figure. So pretty much I'm calling that function with uh, Robson projection. That's what we use for base map. I'm setting a global axis. I'm setting a coastline. And I'm adding a feature for the land. And then, as you can see, I can just plot it. Some data, it's nice for you to uh, set these transform projections if you want it to be transformed to geodetic uh, projection, and I'm going to explain that in a minute, what's going to happen here. Does anyone see any difference from the previous picture that we did? The Sorry? The lateral, the lateral lines. This one is correct. No one noticed, but the previous one, the date line was not well resolved. So we had this horizontal lines connecting uh, around the, the globe. Base map does not solve the date line. Cartopy does. What's another difference? Yeah, exactly. We don't have the, the labels, right? So I asked the question, but you got stickers as well. One sticker for her and one for you. <laughs> and that's it. That's all the stickers I have. So. Sorry. So Cartopy is still under development. So we don't have the labels, the tick labels, on all the projections. We do have those on the rectilinear projections. Uh, Plat Carré, um, Mercator, and other projections like those we can do. Grid lines, we're going to do those. But on the curvilinear one, we don't have yet. It's to come. It's under development. So this here is just to show how Cartopy solved the date line problem. We are going to plot two lines in two different ways. One that's with the plot carré projection. Is anyone here familiar with GIS terms? Like I'm saying this projection, so, but maybe people don't know. Like, do you know what 
particle ray projection is. It's unprojected, right? And then we're gonna plot as geodetic coordinates. So this is what we have. Like the green line is the geodetic and the blue line is the particle ray. So particle ray just collect, uh, connects the dots as a straight line and the geodetic does the right thing. Like draws, like if we're drawing it on a globe. Sorry? When I do the projection, like here, it does the right thing. And when I don't, it just... Just Matplotlib. Like, just, as you can see, it's a Matplotlib. Because we gave it the projection here. So Matplotlib has this mechanism to pass on other projections. Have you ever plot a polar plot in Matplotlib? You have to define the projection for polar plots and give that to the figure. It's virtually the same thing, but instead, uh, yeah. It, it, it's a pretty cool way to solve the problem because then you, uh, how can you say that? You outsource all the plotting to another library. You don't need to worry about that. So pretty much what CartoPy does, what I was explaining is this. You create a, a Matplotlib access ob object with the knowledge of the projection and CartoPy adds some extra methods to that uh, access object. So let's do one exercise. Let's create two access objects. One that's a true and simple matplotlib and one that has a projection. And then let's compare what's different between those, like what extras CartoPy added to that access. I'm gonna give one minute for you to try to do that. We do have the solution. Uh, try not to load the solution and just execute it. Try to do it yourself. I'm actually gonna leave the solution here in just in case you wanna copy, but it's nice if you type that to memorize the commands. Yes, I'm gonna talk about resources for that later, but uh, there is a gallery. The best way to create figures is to find someone that already did what you wanna do. So the same way there is the Matplotlib gallery, there is the CartoPy gallery. And pretty much you look at the pictures and see if there is something similar and just copy and paste and change. But uh, if you explore the CCRS object, you're gonna see all the projections that's in there and that already gives you a clue of what you may wanna do or not. So our minutes pass, so probably you already figured it out. <coughs> Pretty much what I'm doing here, I'm gonna create one access object that's vanilla matplotlib, no projection, and then I'm creating another one that has the projection. And then what I'm doing here is pretty much I'm extracting all the methods. I'm throwing away the private methods, so they start with an underscore. And then I'm using a Python trick that I'm creating a symmetric difference, so I'm getting only what's different from those two. I'm throwing away everything that's common so I can actually see what's new, what CartoPy added. And here what it is, CartoPy added all these methods. Some of them make sense for us, like add coastline, uh, projection, and others don't make sense right now, but throughout this tutorial we're gonna learn how to use them. One of those that I printed here, the get extent, as you can see, Matplotlib starts a figure from zero to one. A figure with a projection starts with a global projection from 180 to 180, 90 to 90. So here are the new methods added that we already used, or we're gonna use more. The coastline, set global, grid lines, add features, set extent projection, and get extent. Here are some that I'm probably not gonna talk about too much here, but I left them here so you can look them up later. Cartopi has some really advanced features like adding raster images, uh, from adding images from WMS and WTMS services. Is everybody familiar with WMS and all these terms? Like it's wrapping map services, those slip maps, so you can add a figure from those. 
So the first thing that we want to do that we didn't do on our previous features, previous figure because we couldn't, is to add grid lines and labels, right? To do the label, we are going to use the Matplotlib ticker, and we are going to do very fancy formatting. So we are going to import from CardoPy these latitude and longitude format formatters. We're going to use our same uh, function. Like I said, I like to define functions for my math because I can then just reuse them. But like I said, we cannot do those on the Robson projection. So we have to do those on a rectilinear projection. I'm using the path here. here. This stock image is just a pre-built image that Cartopie has, just to make the figure a little bit prettier. Cartopie has this uh, features, which basically download global data sets on, uh, on request for you. And this is another nice difference between Cartopie and BaseMap. BaseMap is a monolithic package with more than 100 megabytes with all the data. Cartopie is really lightweight. But when you need the data, it will download the data on the fly for you. So in this case, we are downloading data from the GSHHS. And here, remember those ones and zeros where to put the labels? With Cartopie, there are actually words that I understand. So I'm not, in, I'm not putting uh, lines on the bottom and on the left. I'm just putting them on the right and on the top. Uh, if I comment this out, I have labels everywhere. So this is easier to remember. I'm also passing the format here. And here, what I'm doing is that I'm defining by hand where my tick labels are. So hopefully this is pretty clear for those that are familiar with uh, Matplotlib. Any question on this? Can I move on? So another exercise. Pretty much check the grid line options and make your own changes. Make style changes to those grid lines. Uh, you can copy and paste the figure above if you don't want to open the solution here. And does everybody know how to investigate options on the Jupyter Hub? There are two ways to do that. You either type the method, you put a question mark at the end and you execute the cell. You're going to open up a pop-up with the help. Or you open and close the parentheses and you do shift the tab inside it. You're going to have a pop-up with the options as well. Those two work. I like the shift tab one because I don't have to execute the cell. I'm going to leave the answer here on the screen just in case. But do something different. In my case here, I let me make this smaller. I made the font bigger. I changed the color. So one minute for that. Uh, Alt and R. Or I think you can do that with the mouse too if you go on yeah, the top center. Actually, Got it? So yesterday we had Jake here talking about Altair and all those fancy interactive plotting and how easy it was to go from a pandas data frame to a plot with very little code. I'm here to do the opposite. We're going to write a lot of code, do static plots, and we have very ugly old syntax. So you can play with this set extent too, if you want to make a map that's global, or you can change that to any other area. You probably just have to adjust the tick labels accordingly. It should do the right thing. 
if you do the transform using the geodetic uh, projection, it should do the right thing. If it doesn't open an issue. <laughs> so I'm just gonna move on uh, to <clears throat> the next plot, but feel free to go back here and play with this anytime. And if you have any questions, ask on Slack or send me a personal message later, I'm more than happy to answer those. Uh, just to advertise what else CartoPy has, uh, it has this IO sub module with a bunch of extras. And one of the nice extras that we have is these image tiles. So they are pre built tile systems where I can just tap into things like OpenStreetMap, Google Maps, or any other tile services and plot that as a Matplotlib, Matplotlib image. Uh, we're all used to those as sleepy maps on our cell phones, but if you need a high resolution map of some place, you can just do that and have a static image to plot. Uh, most people that work with uh, cities or complicated coastlines that you don't have data, they, they use that resource. Another resource that Catopi has built in is the Natural Earth resource. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, BaseMap only uses the G88S uh, database for state lines, count lines, county lines, and everything. Cartopi uses the Natural Earth because Natural Earth is more up to date. And pretty much like the GSHS feature, it downloads on the fly for you. The only thing a little bit awkward about that is these keywords, they're based on Natural Earth classification. So if you go on their website, it just makes sense. But if you're typing this, like you want state, and that's a cultural category, uh, it's kind of odd. Like at least in Brazil, geopolitical divisions are not cultural. They're called geopolitical divisions. But that's state divisions. So you can get a really nice map of the US with just the states drawn. And as you can see, I use matplotlib tricks here to remove the axes and remove all the grid lines. So I just want a floating map or a web page or something like that. Uh, there are, on the network, if you have rivers, um, you have coastlines, you have population density, you have all sorts of data in there. It's a shapefile. It's a shapefile. Yeah, that's where it provides shapefiles. Uh, for me, this is special, special because uh, everybody in Brazil that uses the GSHS data to plot the states, they get it wrong because it's so outdated that there are two new states from 1980 that are not there. So when Metro Earth came and Cartopi tapped into that, it was awesome. Like, like finally Brazilians can publish a paper with the right geopolitical division. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that happened in other countries as well. Don't get me wrong, GHHS is amazing for Europe and the US, but it's horrible anywhere else. Uh, another nice thing that you can do is image overlays. Uh, again, because it's a matplotlib object, you can just read the image and use the axis image show. You can also uh, pass along a projection for that. The only trick here is that you need to know the corners of your image. So I know that beforehand. So I put the corners of my image in there and it's gonna scale correctly to what you need. Like in this particular case, we had this uh, AVHRR image where we want to plot a cruise that would cross that eddy. So pretty much you just scan the image, georeference using the corners, and voila, you can plot it on top of it. Sure. Can, can you speak louder, sorry? Yes, you can. I mean, it's just an NumPy array uh, representation of the image. If you can load the image as an NumPy array, you can plot it. You can. Uh, not directly. You have to do that yourself. Uh, you, you need some geoprocessing to get uh, that information yourself. Um, I have an example on how to do that on my web page, but I don't remember the details. I can send that on Slack later. But, but nowadays I recommend using raster IO. Raster IO, um, I think I'm gonna touch it on the tutorial later on, but it's, if you're using raster images, use raster IO. It makes your life so much easier. It extracts all the information, uh, all the projections. So we're gonna get there, hopefully. Uh, so shape files, we plot rasters, we plot shape files. What are those? Uh, who here is familiar with shape files? Great, 
virtually everybody, so I can go a little bit faster here. So pretty much all these uh, features from Cartopy, it's downloading shape files locally for you on the fly, and you can request the different uh, resolutions. In this case, I'm requesting the full resolution of the GS HHS for a certain region, and I'm gonna plot that as a coastline. If you remember on phase map, we, the only information that we had was GS HHS. On Cartopy, we have Natural Earth, we have uh, GSHS and we have, if I'm not mistaken, there's a third one. So we have more options for data. This is a little bit slow because the first time you execute it, it's gonna download all the data. Like I had this on my computer already pre-downloaded, so it's gonna be fast, but here it's gonna take a while. So I'm gonna be talking here randomly for a few seconds until the figure appears. The first time you do it, it's cached, but there is a script where you can download everything if you want to. Uh, you usually, you never want to do that. You want to do that on the fly. But just if it's the first time, the second time is going to be way faster. Yeah. I only download everything when I'm teaching workshops with no Wi-Fi. That's the only reason. Yeah. Damn, it's taking too long. I just ran this early uh, at breakfast and didn't take that long. <laughs> oh, yeah, there it is. So we have this nice coastline of this bay from the GS HHS. And, but if you look at it quickly, uh, you're probably not familiar with this region. There are some rivers here that's not in that data. So sometimes you want your custom data on the map. And Cartopy makes that easy by reading any kind of shape file. So here I'm gonna open my own shape file using pandas, uh, GeoPandas actually, sorry. Who here is familiar with GeoPandas? So the same way Raster.io is the best tool for raster images, GeoPandas is the best tool for vector uh, data. It's hands down the best way to, to load the shape file. Here I have just a single geometry on my GeoPandas and I'm gonna pass that geometry to Cardopy and now I have all the high resolution details that I was missing on the other figure, like all that river is here, which was absent on this one. So it's pretty easy to get your own custom data there. So reprojecting data. Uh, usually we have to reproject our data when we collect in a different projection, like if you have a GPS set on UTM or something like that. Uh, I'm gonna go over an example here just to show how Cartopy can make that easy. I'm first gonna do a standard reprojection and then I'm gonna do a Cartopy reprojection. So we're gonna load this Excel spreadsheet that has UTM coordinates. And I'm gonna use PyProj that under the hood use Proj4. <laughs> Here? Yeah, I had a custom shape file that I did from an image. Uh, I had an image and there is this software that's called Filigree that can do the, the drawing. So basically you click on the ocean, you click on the land, and the automatically try to figure out where the boundaries are, and then you need to adjust that manually a little bit. Yeah, this is not survey data. It's It's, it's a different plot, uh, it's a different plot, right? So here is just the GSHS, and here is the more high resolution data. And this one is the truth. I, I know that area well, I, I was raised there. <laughs> so all these islands and all those coastlines and everything, so this is, is the truth. So everything that disappeared didn't really, really exist, it's an artifact on the other data set, and everything that's showed up actually exists. There are still a few rivers missing actually, there are a few rivers here that are not there. So reprojecting our data. Um, the standard to reproject data actually to deal with projections is a software called Proj4. I don't know if you ever had to interact with it directly, but I'm pretty sure if you ever did a reprojection, you interact with it indirectly. Uh, one way to interact with it is via PyProj. It's a Python module that reads Proj4. 
But Prod4 is very awkward because you have these Prod strings that are really hard to read and understand. You need this plus. You, you did this once. Yeah. Everybody that felt that pain knows how hard it is. You need this plus and all these equals. And in this case, I'm doing a new TM. Uh, it's the 24th zone. It's on the south hemisphere. The ellipse and the datum are WGS84, and the, the units are emitter. So I have then to concatenate that string, pass it to proj, and then create this UTM object that will convert it from X and Y to latitude and longitude. Because I'm going to geographic coordinates, I need to use inverse true, which is pretty much odd because that information is in my proj string. Like I just declared that's UTM. So the proj has this idiosyncrasies. But I get latitude and longitude. So now I can plot it, right? Sorry? Yeah, I, I just based on the same data frame. Oh, I see. Yeah, I like to do that to keep my data organized. I do everything in place. I don't create new variables. So, and I can see here which one is which by line. And so now, what I'm going to do? I'm going to do. I'm going to plot those latitudes and longitudes, but I'm also going to do the Carto Pi version of that conversion. So, first advantage, I don't need an extra package. I don't need Pi Proj. Second advantage, I just create a new projection. And the projection is a little bit easier to read than the string proj. Just a little bit easier. It's still a little bit awkward. Like, I have the zone. I tell that south hemisphere is equal to true. And I have the globe object. And the globe object, both the datum and the ellipse, are WGS4. So it's very similar to the proj string. It's just a higher level Python object. So I'm plotting one on top of the other just to ensure that they are the same and they are the same. Like in this case, as you can see, yeah, I'm just giving X and Y and the transform projection, and I don't care. It will know what it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Everybody that's into mapping loves this. So I can see there's at least one in the audience that likes mapping, the same as I do. So you're going to love this. The XKCD for mapping, and that defines your personality based on the map projection that you like. Uh, sorry, if you don't like any, you don't have a personality. You have to like at least one of those. <laughs> so I'm going to go to the next notebook. So, so this next notebook here, oops, sorry, here. It's all about interactive maps. So we're doing static maps all the time. But every now and then, we need interactive maps, right? And I saw some people going ahead of time and playing with this already, because I can see everybody's laptop. So I can see who is cheating. Uh, so Zip Maps, uh, the software that I use mostly uh, every day, it's Folium. But I'm completely biased, because I wrote it. But there are others. Uh, so Folium is pretty much a wrapper for leaflets. Leaflet is a JavaScript library to do sleep maps. Every sleep map that you have on your cell phone or that you see on a web page is leaflet at the end of the day. So in this case, we're doing a very simple map where I just plot a marker saying that you are here. I think I got uh, the science address here, but we can pretty much put any latitude and longitude. If you don't give anything, um, you can still get a map. Like I'm not giving a center or a zoom. But then you need to zoom in to see where your marker is. And, and in this case, the base map is the OpenStreetMaps um, tiles. So this is like a leaflet. It's basically like a leaflet map. It's just it is leaflet at the end of the day. Volume is just a wrapper to help you write the leaflet code. Right, yeah. You can open this as an HTML, and it's all leaflet. Yeah. Like the, the original author, actually, I, I'm a maintainer of Folium. The original author, he said it's uh, JavaScript maps Python data. That was the goal. Yeah. So a very quick exercise. And this one, there is no answer, because I want you to experiment with it. Folium has these many plugins. 
and there are at least three that I'd like you to check out. So let's create a map and add uh, those plugins on the map. And I'm gonna do one here with you. So I'm gonna import volume plugins. Get out of the slide modes. And let's create a map. I get two kind of plugins. I'm gonna use the full screen plugin. You need to add the plugin to the map. That's how we do it. It has a method that's add to map, and then you pass the map object. And I'm gonna do the drawing plugin as well. in a moment. Um, is that easier to read? So now, as you can see, I don't have only my, my base map. I have all this that was added via the plugins, and this is pretty neat because like the drawing plugin, I can draw polygons, I can draw squares, circles, I can put markers on the map, I can do all sorts of things, and I can edit them if I don't like the way they are, I can move them around, and I can delete them if I want. The latest version of Folium, uh, you can save these at GeoJSON files. Folium has one big defect, it's not two-way interactive, so I can create these objects and I can save them and can load them again, but I cannot throw them back into Python automatically. We're gonna talk about a software that does that later, that actually has the proper JavaScript to do that. Folium is two-way-ish in a sense that you have to do it yourself. You need to save and reload. Uh, IPyLeaflet does that for you automatically. Yeah, you, you can save all those objects at GeoJSON objects. And if you want them back, you have to read them again. And the full screen is pretty neat, especially for notebooks, because you get this button where you can blow up your map and put them on the big screen. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on, uh, but feel free to play with other plugins. There are several plugins on Folium. Pretty much every leaflet plugin that exists can be wrapped to become a Folium plugin as well. And now I'm gonna show a full-fledged example that might interest some of you here. I'm gonna create a thematic map for one of the IU's regions, that's the Sekura region, where we're gonna show all the buoys, the HF radar, and all the information that comes from the GeoJSON that they provide on their web page. So first I'm gonna create a map center on the Sekura region. Sekura, for those who doesn't know, is the Southeast Ocean Ocean Observing System. Uh, it's Florida, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina states. Um, and I'm gonna load those GeoJSON files that they provide with all the information for these stations in the HF radar. Pretty much what they have here is the name, the position, if it's active or inactive, and they even have an icon to plot those on a map. So here I'm gonna parse that GeoJSON by extracting that information and passing those to Folium. So I'm gonna create an icon on Folium using the icon URL that's in that GeoJSON. And I'm gonna create a marker with that information. I'm also creating a pop-up with the station names. Here I'm just gonna style my GeoJSON. Uh, those who are familiar with uh, GeoJSON know that you can uh, edit them for the color, the transparency, and everything. Um, but there are two standards that's kind of annoying. There is this simple spec for GeoJSON that I think Mapbox uses, and there is the leaflet style. Folio uses the leaflet style because it wraps leaflet. So in this case, we're using the leaflet style. So all these keywords are documented on the leaflet style, like fill color, color, weight, and opacity. So I create a style function to style my GeoJSON. Uh, th that blue that we saw in the drawing, yeah, yeah it's pretty boring. 
it's just a washed out blue. Um, here I'm gonna do the same thing for the HF radar like we did for the station geojson, but here I'm gonna pass the style functions when there is a polygon because for the HF radar they actually had this range uh, geojson that we're gonna show on the map. And voila, we have our thematic map for the Sakura region. So it's relatively easy to do. All we need was a geojson file and parse that file and put them on a map. And we have all the pop-ups here, if you wanna know, like this is the Jacko Island Station HF Raider. This is the geojson that we're styling, like this, the range of the HF uh, bases. This one is inactive, that's uh, red, and I think the yellow is under maintenance, and so on and so forth. So it's pretty easy to create a um, thematic map. So pretty much like Cartopi, Folion has a gallery. If you wanna do one of those maps and you don't know where to start, look at our examples. Um, one software I'd like to touch very briefly on mapping, it's called GridGeo. Who here works with numerical models? No one? Oh, just one, two, okay. So every now and then we have to plot numerical models grids uh, on a map and they're very, uh, there's no standard. You have rectilinear models, covilinear models, finite element models. So this software we created to, so we can parse any kind of model and get a grid out of it. Uh, it recognizes the type of the grid automatically if you are U-grid or S-grid compliant and it can create a grid mesh and outline and you can plot that on a map. It's a little bit slow because this particular model that I chose is very high resolution so it's gonna take a while for us to compute the outline. But you have a vector representation of the grid for that model by just giving an etcdf file. And it can read from open data as well. That's what we're doing there. So let's wait for the processing. Any questions so far? They are, they're on the Jupyter Hub, and they, there are more updated versions of those. Uh, but they are available on the, yeah, they are available on our Jupyter Hub, on our GitHub repository, that's the version that I use here, but the most up-to-date ones are also available on the web, for particular. Kyle should know, should ask him. <laughs> so this is the grid outline for this particular model that, I'm, that I was reading, and we can explore this, the cells of the model, I'm just getting the first cells there. There are a triangular mesh, finite element model, and it's pretty easy to put them on a Matplotlib uh, static map as well, but that's boring. We can put that on a sleeping map too, which is more interesting. And there we go, we have the outline of that model on, on a snip map. Uh, Emilio, do you know what model is this? It's here from the news. Okay. I'm gonna find that. Then. Yeah, it's very high resolution. That's why it's slow to to create the outline. Uh, I just plot the outline on purpose because if I plot the, the all these the triangles, the computer would freeze. There is a trick to plot the triangles, though. Uh, I'm gonna mention that by the end of the tutorial. But you don't use vector, you use raster, and you re-render them every zoom level. So I mentioned that one of the biggest following defects is that not two-way. IPy leaflet is two-way, and it's very similar to Folium. IPy leaflet uh, was born from the Jupyter folks. Uh, they are developing this. So it's very similar, as you can see, you have a map object, center, zoom, they both wrap leaflets, so uh, knowledge from one to the other is very transferable. And here it's just gonna show one example that they have on their gallery where they're gonna use X-ray. Um, we're gonna know more about X-ray in a moment when John Hammer gets here. And we read the data set of winds and we use a leaflet plugin that show the winds like if they were moving on a map. And pretty much like Folium, any leaflet plugin, you can wrap it and you can show that the only difference here is that if I go back on my code and I change it, this map is updated on a folio map that doesn't happen. 
And if I draw something here, I can get a Python object too. So that's the advantage of IPI leaflet uh, on top from Prodi. Any questions? No? Am I too fast or? Does that take any mental to get to the next Yes, because it's using X-ray to read it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, I was on the fence when they chose X-ray to put on uh, as IPI to leaflet um, dependency because it forces you to download a lot of things, but then it kind of makes sense because most of the data they're going to re be reading is HDF or NetCDF, so at the end of the day, they're going to be installing X-Ray anyway, so it made sense. Yeah. yeah. So it's a model, not a global Yeah. So some extras here. Um, all this sleepy map, they can take any base map that you want, including some fancy uh, base maps that NASA has that show you other places than Earth. And I don't have any stickers, but I'll definitely give you one sticker. I'll, sh I'll send you to your home if you figure out what is this. No, it's Mars. If you click, you have a pop-up that can kind of help you. No one? From the book. Yeah. I didn't see the movie. <laughs> yes, this is all the path that he did ever since he got uh, stranded on Mars. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You got a sticker. Okay, so let's go to the next notebook. I wasn't the one that actually got that, this data. This data is from uh, Car2DB. It's a mapping service. They did that just for fun. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty much doing like a, an overview on all these packages. Uh, I'm no expert on any of those, but I can direct your questions to the experts if you have any questions, okay? And especially this one, it's one that I didn't have time to play with yet. It's called EarthSim. EarthSim is not really a package, it's more a collection of packages. And what they're trying to do, they're trying to make all these two-way interactions easier. Um, they use GeoViews, HoloViews, and Bokeh for that. Those are all plotting libraries. So in this case, I'm gonna create a map. And I'm gonna plot that with HoloViews here just activating it. And you have those drawing uh, mechanisms that we had, but with a more fancy thing, like we can do, I can have this um, tooltip showing where it is. I can click and add more points. I just don't remember how. I can move the points. And you get that back. And this is a nice feature. Like, if you click and add more points, and then I check them here. Let me try to add points. I don't know why it's not going there. So to add a point, just click. So it should add it. I'm not sure why it's not adding. It did some. Oh, yeah. That it is. So you see, as I add more points, and now I check the data stream, the points are there. So this kind of two-way interactions is pretty neat. This is what I told that you cannot do on Folio. I could save it and load it, but here it's in there. It's on memory. Uh, and you have all sorts of objects. You have the box object. Um, same thing, two-way, you can get the box back. You have uh, lines and polygons. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show uh, things here so we can go to the last notebook. And you can have a shape file, and you can add it too. And this is pretty cool. So for example, in this case, let me zoom in. Here, it's a view zoom, zoom in. And here is to edit. And now, suppose that you are creating the mesh for this model. You can come here and fine tune your mesh and fix things. 
In this case, it's because it's really high resolution. Even the outline has way too many points, but you can create your mesh, and once you're done, you can go there and triangulate it and start your model. So you move mesh nodes You can move mesh nodes, yep. And one thing that I'm not showing here that answers your question, uh, when you're plotting a very high resolution triangular mesh, you can plot it, but it's not really a vector. What it does, it pre-computes the raster images for each zoom level. So as you zoom in, it looks like it's redrawing the triangles, but it's just replotting new images, pre-computed images. Uh, in that case, you don't have interactivity. It's just, yeah, it's just a visualization tool. Yeah. Yeah. So for more information, there is a website here. It's a pretty new project, but it's pr very interesting, and there, there is a lot of potential in there. So any question before we move to the next one? I should have brought more stickers. The question stopped. So the last notebook is more on GeoPandas, Shapely, and Raster.io. Um, let me go back to slide mode here. So GeoPandas is your to-go software for vector data. Uh, Shapely, it helps you deal with uh, vector as well, but helps you create, uh, how can I say that? Interact with those shapes and ask questions, like does this intersect with that? Does this contain that? And we're gonna do an exercise here on this. And Raster.io is your to-go software for raster images. Uh, like she asked about GeoTiffs. If you load the GeoTiff with Raster.io, you have the CRS information for free there when it reads. So in this case, I'm going to open uh, these two files. They are countries and lakes uh, in rivers data from natural earth with GeoPandas. And I'm going to explore that pretty much as I explore any pandas data frame. In this case, I have the geometries, and I have the continents, the names, and the ISO three-letter code. So it's pretty neat to have a geographical data as a panda data frame, especially for those that are familiar with pandas, this is pretty cool. It has a plotting library uh, functionality, but it's not projected. It's not like cart or pie. It's easy for you to do a quick visualization and inspect your data, but you're not gonna be using this for publication figures. It's really just a very quick tool to check your data. If you want a, a professional map or well projected or anything, you have to use cart or pie. Uh, so when exercise, actually I just answer, uh, do a type on that access object from that figure. Uh, and you're gonna see that's not projected. Uh, let me do that here. So you all know how to use Python's type to ask for a type, right? It's a raw matplotlib access object. It's not projected. So let's do an exercise here. I'm gonna get that river uh, GeoPandas data frame, and I'm gonna squeeze out only the Amazon river. And Jupyter Notebook knows about shapely objects, so the wrapper is the actual object. We can see it there, so that's the line for the river. We can ask what type is this. It's a shapely line stream. And we can do all sorts of shapeless uh, operations. Oh, I got ahead of myself again. I was asking you to do that. So we can do some fancy geographical questions like what countries this line crosses? So pretty much we're asking how, what countries do the Amazon crosses? And there we have it, a subset of our countries data frame from all the countries that the Amazon crosses. So uh, the Amazon River starts in Peru, Colombia, and ends in Brazil. Eric, yep. Here? Yeah. Yeah. If you don't squeeze, let me show you. Like. Yeah. 
No, it's not about that. It's about uh, arrays, NumPy arrays, because GeoPandas uses NumPy arrays to store their objects. So here is just like a, a Geo series, right? Just one line of the data. So when I get the geometry, what I get back is this line string object on, uh, because I could have multiple geometries in there, more than one. And by squeeze, if it's a single geometry, I'll get only that geometry. If it's more than one, I will still get uh, a list or an array of geometries. Another way of doing it, I could do this. But in this case, if I had more geometries there, I would, be, I would lose those. I only get the first one. So I don't really know how many geometries are there. Okay. That's why I usually use a squeeze, because if there is only one, I'll get one. And if there's more than one, I'll get them all. And I'll figure out later what to do with them. Some line strings are broken into multiple geometries. So we have all these methods on a shapely object. So pretty much the GeoPanda data frame has this, its ultimate object, the geometry, are shapely objects. So it has this equals, contains, crosses, joints, intersects, overlaps, touches, within, and covers. So if you're doing GIS, it's very handy. Um, all these terms are actually defined here, if you want to know the semantics about those operations. I'm an oceanographer, I'm not a cartographer, so I never really learned that properly. And I usually go to the website to remember what they mean. So let's do an exercise. Uh, for those that are ahead of ourselves, we probably already know the answer to this question. Does Brazil share a border with any European country? What do you think? Yes or no? Yes. It, it is a trick question, and most of you already run it. Yeah, so yes. probably not, right? So let's do that. That's that exercise. I was hoping to get you guys <laughs> Yeah, only you and I understand that. <laughs> we can expand that joke later <laughs> over some beers. So what we're going to do, we're going to squeeze out the geometry of Brazil from the country's data frame. And we're going to ask which of those countries in the whole data frame intersects with Brazil. And that's the answer. We have Argentina, Bolivia, of course, Brazil itself, Colombia, France. France? <laughs> yes, Brazil has a border with France, for those who don't know. It's actually a French territory, the oh, French Guiana. Okay. <laughs> so let's plot that. Uh, here. So there you go. That's <laughs> France is right here, in case you don't know. You have Guiana, French Guiana, and Suriname. So yeah, Brazil has a border with an European country. We just don't get to go to Paris that easily, though. Oops, sorry. So Raster.io. Raster.io is. Um, like I said, the to-go library for raster images. In this case, we're going to open a GeoTIFF that Valentina asked. And the type of the data set is a data set reader. So raster.io, because it's always used with really heavy weight data, like some GeoTIFFs are really heavy, it doesn't load on memory. It was going to load on memory when you request. So it's all, always a reader. Uh, I know that now X-Ray has um, a raster I.O. interface, so you can actually do that with X-Ray. I'm not experienced with that yet, I haven't tried it yet, but if you have to use the raw raster I.O., it's also lazy loaded, so it's pretty cool. You don't get to blow up your memory. So you can show all the channels that we have there, the red, green, and blue. You can show histograms from that. I'm just fitted on my screen. So you can show the histogram for all the channels. If you are into satellite uh, image processing, that makes sense to you. If you are not, just pretend that's a cool thing. Uh, you have all the information from the GeoTIFF, like uh, how many bands we have, three, what's the coordinate reference, it's EPGS 4326, what the driver pressure you use to read that image, it's a GeoTIFF. The type, it's uh, integers, the hive, and etc. And even the affine transformation to put that on, on a map. So 
you can. And then the reader, yeah, you can get only one band and subsample the, that one band, and then you don't need to care about reading all the data. You can read just a smaller part. You can, but that's, yes, you can, but that's easier with uh, X-ray. And I have an example of that. No, no, you, you can do that. X-ray is using Rasteril under the hood. But the reason why you can do that is because Rasteril is ready for that. However, the syntax with X-ray is easier. So we're gonna do that in a moment. Uh, so in this case, I'm just getting one of the bands. So I, I read it, now I have the actual data. And I'm gonna plot that with CartoPy. And the beauty of Raster.io having its own coordinate reference system is that I can pass that along to CartoPy, and CartoPy will know what to do with that raster image, and I can reproject that into any projection that I want. So if you are into raster image processing, this is really cool. I got a pixel image X and Y, and I put that on an interrupted geo homolocyne projection very easily. And the magic is here. Like a it, it, it will know what to do. It will know what to do. So really big data sets, answering your questions from earlier. So if you have a really big image that you don't, that you want to slice it before plotting, do it with X-ray interface for SRIO. It's still SRIO, but oh, sorry. I need to execute something before here. Okay, let's go back. So in this case, I have this image that's 15 gigabytes. So uh, my laptop, I don't have enough memory to read that. And I was hoping to show you my laptop memory as I process this, but I have no idea the memory on this machine. But maybe this machine doesn't have enough memory to process that. So let's see what X-Ray can do to help us here. So. We have the same information, uh, it's just in a different way. Like, unfortunately here, X-Ray decided to extract it in the um, project string, so it's hard to read. I liked the raw Raster.io meta dictionary, but it's literally the same information, right? And so I'm pretty much gonna pass along where I want to start and end reading that image and do the slicing. As you can see, everything is happening autom very quickly. I click and, and it's not processing anything. Pretty much because X-rays use desk under the hood and everything is lazily loaded. I'm not actually requesting that data yet. Uh, the re I'm creating a mesh with that data and the data is not here, it's not loaded. Now I'm gonna load the data, finally, at the plotting time. So let me go back to line mode so you can see this bigger. So as you can see, everything up to here was really quick, right? Yeah. So now I actually have a time magic from Jupyter there to count how long it's gonna take to get that data. And because I subsampled and did all the pre-processing beforehand, X-Ray is very smart to only get exactly what I need. So from a 15 gigabytes image, I got a subset in one and a half seconds. If anyone had ever to deal with a 15 gigabytes image and had to do this operation, know how painful it is. And we did this like with literally one hand just clicking. You can't, this is actually a remote data set, but, oh no, this is on S3 bucket, yeah. But you can read remote data sets. So again, you can put that image on a sleeping map if you want. Uh, the only reason I did this is because I had no idea where that was. So I wanted to check where it was. Um, I'm no expert in the United States uh, geography, but somewhere in Kansas. Oh. Yeah. As a non-American, I see Kansas, I usually think, oh, that's where Superman landed. That's all I know. <laughs> uh, 
So putting it all together, uh, we usually we do mappings with a reason, right? The thematic map that we did for Sakura or anything else, we basically want to show uh, information on a map. And I have a few examples here. I'm not going to load them up, mostly because I saw you all already load them, and I could see on your laptop, but you can do this later. And I'm just going to use the rest of my time here to answer questions or do some extra exercise if you want. Just before we go, I want to advertise some extra packages that I didn't talk about. HV plot is uh, part of the EarthSim stack. It's a really cool package where you can load, for example, an XCDF with X-Array, request a plot from X-Array, and you have for free a uh, slider where you can navigate the whole data. So you can go from, you can navigate in time, you can navigate in X and Y, and I have a notebook for that for my lightning talk yesterday. I'm gonna post that on Slack for you to show. GeoViews is part of the EarthSim as well. We actually used it on our example, but I didn't went on the details on how it works. GeoViews tries to be uh, declarative and not imperative, pretty much the same thing that Jake uh, was talking about yesterday, where you can add things up, like I have coastline plus my data plus population data, and it creates the map. So it tries to be more high level plotting. And for old school guys like me, there is finally a nice GMT interface for Python. You use GMT? Uh, well, you're right, that's the question, but this interface is really cool, and it's, you know, it's nostalgic. Yeah. Uh, all young kids, you don't know what you're talking about, but GMT used to be the only plotting library a long time ago, and it's still pretty good. It's still one of the best. Just had a very awkward syntax, and it writes only Postgres. But now we have a really nice Python interface for it. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you. Oh, I have the HTTP pod here. I forgot to commit that. So let me show you this. Huh. Yeah, so pretty much I'm loading an X array data set. Um, you knew that already and you didn't tell me. And look how cool it is. You can just navigate the data set. It's almost like creating a movie. Okay. And last but not least, we have a ton of those uh, examples on our website, on the IUS code gallery. So if you go there, we're probably going to see a lot of these maps and examples. So that's all that I have for you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask on Slack or ask me directly. Remember, we have the box for suggestions. And we are always looking to improve ourselves and improve this tutorial. Thank you for your attention.